Can we start it? Yep. You started. Okay, you want to get your presentation up? Zoom meeting. Open Zoom meeting. Okay, if we're going to get started over here. Thank you all for coming. We had a little uh, issues with uh, with traffic and also had issues with people getting sent to the wrong place, but I think it's uh, it's time to get started. So um, in the interest of time, since we're starting a little late, I'm going to, there are some people who have not heard my joke yet, my one joke, but I'm not going to tell my one joke tonight because I think we'll, we'll do that later. If anybody wants to hear my one joke, um, uh, I'll do that later. But basically, the segue of the joke is really the most important thing. Uh, what the uh, the segue to the joke is. I didn't see you there. You get going like this. We can't hear it. We have a microphone? I thought. Okay. We're going to get started over here. Thank you all for coming. So I'm going to use my loud voice over here. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do my one joke since most Can people... These people groan when I tell my own joke. Um, but the main thing is to have the segue of the joke. The segue of the joke is if you know the odds of things, you have a much better chance of success. If anybody wants to hear the joke, I would love to tell it to you, but some people would be groaning right now if I told it. So, um, but anyway, um, what we're going to be talking about tonight are some, I, I found some interesting things. You're getting a, a three for one deal over here. You're getting three speakers for the price of one. Um, which is which is great. We have some very interesting speakers, and what I like about this is that they're all very different. Like you know, what we like to find do at High Wealth and Tax Solutions is find some different interesting solutions here. And here we're going to be talking about what I find some unique things that people normally can't get access to. So what's interesting about this is you're getting access to several different speakers. You're going to get Adam Hansen's going to be talking about. Uh, institutional real estate that you would normally need a couple hundred million dollars to get access to these managers. You're going to get access to them through his fund. And this is a, a fund that you have quarterly liquidity on. So it's kind of an interesting thing to hear about. Uh, then we're going to have Eric Notos to be talking about how you can get access to pre ipo companies like SpaceX, which I never knew you'd get access to companies like that. Uh, we're also going to, and then we're going to have the cleanup hitter for batting third. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're going to be talking about what I like to call Reese's Peanut Butter Club, which uh, I'll, I'll have uh, I'll have Steve Issa talking about that. So since we started late and since people can always hear what I'm going to say, um, we're going to get started with Adam. And I guess, Adam, you have to talk loud because people say they can't hear you otherwise. I'll use my big boy voice. How's everyone doing? Everybody bring their golf glove. Has everybody been here before? Awesome. Well, it'll be fun. I, I look forward to some golf instruction from everyone. Um, I'm Adam Hansen with Apollo Global Management. Anybody um, familiar with Apollo? Just kind of get a sense. One of our owners just recently bought the Washington Commanders. So that's kind of the, the news. Not in Apollo. He himself has, has done that. But um, we own uh, Yahoo. Anyone familiar with Yahoo? <laughs> that's That's one of our companies. But Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Apollo platform, a couple of our solutions and what we're doing for everyday investors to invest like Harvard, Cornell, like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, some of the largest institutions in the world. Um, there's been a lot of noise about real estate right now, right? Anybody been listening to CNBC? What's going on with real estate? Commercial, Commercial real estate's kind of on, on in the hot seat, right? There's a lot of concern with, with regional banks, right? Being able to refinance. We as a firm, I honestly don't like office. When you think of commercial real estate, that's what they're talking about. Anybody still working here? Or are you all retired rich people that like to golf? All right, so some people work. Anybody going into an office? A couple of you working from home, right? What we've seen is, you know, using, uh, using an example of New York, right? New York pre-pandemic was around, and we're talking office building, was about 95% occupancy. Any idea what that is today? 30%. It's about 45%, right? So if I'm a bank and 
I have Mr. Office Space coming to me and saying, hey, I need to refinance because my, my mortgage is, is over. You think I want to issue that guy a new loan? Nope. No, of course not. Because one, I'm worried about him being able to cover the loan. Two, I don't have the money if I'm a regional bank because what just happened to regional banks? What's our confidence level in banks? No. Not a lot, right? The smaller, the mid-tier banks, you know, they're seeing deposits go out. What do banks do with deposits? They lend them out and they invest. That's not happening right now. So here's what we do. We have a fund where we act as the landlord to the areas of the economy that are doing well. We don't like office. We don't like retail. We don't like hotels. We're allowing our everyday investors to invest in institutional funds that own specifically class A multifamily apartments, top 20 growth cities, right? What's happening here in Florida? We're on the map, right? Everybody's moving here. Jobs are moving here. What's happening with uh, homes? Is there an abundance of open homes? No. What happens when when home or when you see a you know supplies here, demands here? What happens to to home values? I rock. They go up. So for these this young generation that's you know five years into their career, can they afford a home? No. Where do you go? Rent. You're for rent. Well, if on the multifamily homes, right, or apartments, supplies here, demands here, what happens to that? Rents go up, right? So that's an area where we're seeing a lot of success. Our fund is designed to be a chief investment officer for, for real estate. You know, there's a lot of ways that you can own real estate. Um, looks like this. This one's lagging. Let's look over here. Um, what you can't see here, unless you have amazing vision, is this is how you can own real estate. Publicly traded real estate, private real estate. Public debt, private debt. We act as a chief investment officer to give access to everyday investors to owning ownership in, in, in real estate that way. When you look at real estate, there's really five areas that you can own. There's, retail, there's office, there's multifamily, there's industrial, and then there's specialty. Specialty would be like um, a pharmaceutical research facility. Every year, those act independently. Their return profile is different. What do you think the best performers in real estate have been? Medical, so pharmaceuticals, right? Great area. Every single one of you guys have an Amazon package sitting on your front porch when you get home, right? We love industrial. It's my family's favorite hobby. There's no how-to book. We just love ordering things on Amazon. Guess what? That requires an industrial warehouse. There's not enough industrial warehouses. Multifamily, another great area. So our fund over the last eight and a half years, again, this is lagged, sorry. Over the last eight and a half years, we produced a seven, just about a seven and a half percent return with less volatility than the bond market, significantly less volatility than the stock market. One thing that's very nice about this fund is it allows everyday investors to access real estate but without having to deal with the trash, the tenants and toilets. Anybody in here have a rental property? You manage it yourself? You get phone calls every once in a while? Is it fun? Yeah. So we'll give you the benefit of owning real estate, but without anybody ever calling you, right? And if you wake up tomorrow and say, guess what? I want to be done with this. You sell out of our fund. We have liquidity. It's not tomorrow, actually. It's every 90 days. But this fund has paid a 5.22% distribution um, with 75% of that being tax favorable. Everybody looking at treasuries right now? Pretty exciting. Steve, what are treasuries paying? Five. How tax efficient are they? Not very tax efficient. So I think I'm in the right room. For wealthy people, it's not what you make, it's what you keep, right? So the benefit of investing in real estate outside of being non-correlated to your traditional stocks and bonds, right? Last year was the worst year for the 60-40 portfolio, right? Equities were down about 17%. Bonds were down about what, 13? 19 and a half. Okay, I've got the advisor in the room. Okay, bonds were down 14%, S&P 19 and a half. This fund was flat last year. 
while giving a 5.22 distribution. But on the topic of it's not what you make, it's what you keep, of our 5.22% distribution, you're only paying taxes on 25% of it, which when you do a tax equivalent yield, that would be like going and getting a 7.2% uh, um, bond, which you can do today, but you're having to take on some duration risk. So it's worth saying here when you look at the beta, that, that, that speaking terms for saying how it moves the market. So beta 0.14 basically means that the market goes up a dollar, you'll make 14 cents. If it goes down a dollar, if you lose 14 cents. So it really doesn't move much with the market at all. So that's what I find interesting. Yeah. Again, a little bit hard to see. For those that are on computer, you'll be able to see it. But if you look at this chart, what it's doing is it's comparing to the S&P, comparing to the bond market, and comparing to the publicly traded REIT market. There's a green line that's pretty smooth and stable through the middle. That's our fund. So of the last 34 quarters, our fund has produced positive returns 30 out of those 34 quarters, right? The worst year that we had was actually in 2020, right? So really nice story. What we do is we give you access to invest in some of the largest funds um, out there. You're investing alongside pensions and endowments. A little bit hard to see, but these are some hand-selected funds that we that we invest in. Now, they're multi-billion dollar funds. What this column actually is showing, and Steve will send everybody this information, but this column shows the minimum investment to invest in those funds. You've got $5 million down to $25 million just to invest in these funds. So we meet those high minimums for everyday investors. This is a fund that, that you can get into daily. It prices daily. And it offers quarterly liquidity at, at the value on, on that day. But if you wanted to replicate our strategy, it would be a check of over $290 million. Our minimum is $1,000. Now, obviously, Steve wants you to consider more. But um, this is kind of what you see is what you get, right? Industrial, multifamily. And then this is a picture of, of, of uh, medical office. <laughs> We've had 95% occupancy before COVID, during COVID, and today. We collect high 90% um, on, on, our, uh, on our rent. And you're getting access to over $290 billion in, in real estate. So another slide I want to talk about. So 70% of our funds in private real estate. The other 30% is in publicly traded REITs. This is a really good slide. I'll just kind of talk about it. Publicly traded REITs act very different from private real estate. Last year, real estate here in Florida generally went up, right? Can we all agree? Publicly traded REITs on average traded down about 30%. When the REIT market was actually very healthy. When I'm talking about REITs, I'm talking about real estate investment trusts, just for anybody that's not familiar with the jargon. So for us, we said, hey, this makes a lot of sense for us to... What does every investor seek to do? What's the key phrase? I buy, buy high, sell low. No, that's what investors typically do. Buy low, sell high. So last year we saw incredible discounts in, in the REIT market. Fundamentally, things are going well, right? We're avoiding office, we're avoiding retail, we're avoiding hotels. But every time that we've seen this kind of a discount to the value of real estate, Anytime you've seen it at a 15% discount, meaning we can go and buy something at 85 cents on the dollar, your forward return has been as high as 29% in one year and about 55% in three years. Now, I'm not sitting here telling you that that's what we're seeking to do. A portion of our portfolio goes into a publicly traded market. It allows us to give you a really nice uh, forward return while providing stability from the private side. One of the there's other funds that, that offer institutional real estate, but what I think find what I find most attractive about this fund is the aspect where you're getting access to the, the publicly traded market as well, which is trading at a discount. So I think that that's what makes this fund particularly interesting at this particular point. In time. What he said, that's what he said. Yeah, see, that's what he said. He said that's what I said. <laughs> um, so quick question. No, we, we don't own any residential. Too hard to manage, you know, single, 
single tenants. That's what these guys do. And they're the ones with the drink so far. <laughs> um, so that's our real estate fund. I'll give you just a quick idea on a, a credit strategy. So Apollo, we're around 550 billion of assets under management. One of the biggest areas that we do or, or asset classes that we manage is in credit. So we lend money to large companies where they can't get financing. This last year, right? And especially this year, we're hearing about a credit crunch, right? Banks not being able to provide financing. So we have a fund that kind of capitalizes on that opportunity. Um, our fund is also a, a strategy or a, a, a setup similar to this real estate fund. You can buy into it daily. It offers quarterly liquidity, but our credit fund right now is paying a 9.1% distribution. It's up about 5% on the year, but we lend money to large companies. They pay us back plus interest. And it's because they can't get it financing from most places. Anybody familiar with the company RR Donnelly? So RR Donnelly is one of the largest um, financial printing companies. So any, any of this stuff gets printed at RR Donnelly or prospectuses. They do marketing. We just gave them a $1.4 billion loan because they can't go to a bank and get that kind of financing quickly. And they're paying us 12% interest. We're kind of a loan shark for them. It's kind of a uh, take it or leave it. Anybody followed what's been going on with the United Kingdom over the last six months? So Boris Johnson was the prime minister. He stepped down. They had a new prime minister that came in. First thing she talked about doing was was lowering taxes. Well, guess what? That caused an issue for their pension fund. They had a liquidity need. They needed about $3 billion to help support their pension. So we said, hey, we'll give you about a billion dollar loan, but we're gonna charge you 11% for the next six years. So we're a loan shark to pensions. Anybody worried about the United Kingdom defaulting? No, because they're like the US, they can print more money, right? So those are some of the things that we're doing. Um, I'm over my time. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll be around if you have questions, but um, Steve, how do you want this to go? So next on the list is Eric Noto. He's going to be talking about pre-IPO companies, like space, getting access to pre-IPO companies. And Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you guys. Got to move it along over here. Do you want to get access? Uh, yeah, let's see. Hey guys. If you buy it, do you get a ride? I'm sorry? If you buy it into space, actually, yeah. you get a ride. Yeah, you'll be on the next Starship. The next Starship. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to meet all of you. And uh, Steve, thanks for the, the invite. The only quarrel I had with Steve was that this event wasn't in February from the New Yorker. Would have been nice coming down in the winter as opposed to now like mid-April when it's seven degrees now in New York. But uh, maybe maybe next year. Um, again, I'm Eric Noto, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the private shares fund strategy uh, to kind of piggyback on what Adam had mentioned. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> sure. Let me step forward. There's a lot of different ways to invest in the private. As Adam discovered, private real estate, private credit, private equity. And private equity kind of gets thrown around quite a bit, but there's different levels to invest in, in the private equity. Yes. Traditional PE is buyout focus. Now, what the hell does that mean? Right? What that means, you have an investor or a fund that goes out and buys what they believe to be either an undervalued or underperforming asset. And they think that, of course, guy in the room, some nice gals in the room, their experience and expertise, they can turn around that company and either sell it at a profit or take it public. There's another side of the private equity markets, which is where the private share sum folks is, which is venture capital. Now, what is venture capital? Venture capitalists essentially provide working capital into a business that is private to really help continue to facilitate growth, either, le either leading into an exit event, whether that exit event is an IPO or an M&A transaction. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that every private company goes public. And that's not the case. In fact, about two thirds of all private market exits are M&A driven, as opposed to an IPO, which means that we're investing in an entirely larger investable universe than if you're simply just in public. Now, the private shares fund 
is essentially a strategy that democratizes the way in which it allows now all investors to gain access to pre-IPO companies, really late stage private companies. And I'll define a little bit later on how we think of and how we define late stage. What our portfolio is comprised of SpaceX, you're wearing a, a space t-shirt. That's what I just said. Yeah. In space, uh, which just the government contract to build the new International Space Station. Relativity Space, who is actually taking raw materials and 3D printing functional rockets and propulsion systems. So I'll talk about kind of the space economy here shortly, but also two household names that this fund owned a couple of years ago, years before their public market exit. Who's heard of Uber and Spotify? Right. But before I go a little bit more into the fund, why should anyone be remotely interested in investing in the private markets? And it really stems from what has transpired both within the public and the private markets over the last 10, 20, even going back 30 years. And at a very high level, look, the public markets are shrinking. In fact, in the last 30 years, they've been cut in half. I'm not see the chart here. Steve, actually, there were over 8,000 publicly traded companies, meaning 8,000 companies that you, as an investor, could have bought into. Today, there's less than 4,000. Now, during that same time period, what we've also seen is a tremendous influx of capital into much fewer security, globalization, a lot of foreign investments into the U.S. stock market. As a result, well, there's a lot of results as a byproduct of this. We like to highlight two, alpha and correlation. Alpha is becoming a little bit more difficult to generate as there's just simply fewer securities to choose from. And correlation, everything is now moving now more in lockstep than it ever has yeah, the alpha is basically the ability to outperform, right? So that's really what Steve's job is, right? Is to outperform the market. And if there's fewer securities to choose from, for example, a couple of years ago, if you weren't in what was called the FANG stocks, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, it was very difficult to generate alpha or relative outperformance to the benchmark, right? So on one side, the public side, you have this highly efficient yet shrinking marketplace. On the other side, which is the private side, the direct opposite is taking place. Right? The sheer amount of private companies continues to grow. And what drives this growth, as well as what drives what we believe the private shares fund's relevance is pretty straightforward. The average company today is simply staying private for longer. And there are a lot of different reasons as to why your average business is staying private for longer. I'll touch on that in a second. But as these two charts illustrate, Back in 1999, it took a company on average from the time it was launched to when it went public, four years. When they would exit, it was just south of a $500 million market cap. Last year, the average time it took the company to go exit, to go public, was 15 years. And when they would exit, it was a $2.3 billion market cap. So I'm sure everyone probably recognizes, well, and I can kind of point it out because these icons, of course, Pretty small, but in 1980, Apple went public after four years. Cisco Systems, six years. Amazon, 97, went public after three years. But as you start working your way down the graph, again, I'm sure you recognize these names. Spotify, I'm going to start to 14 years. Uber, 10 years. Airbnb, IPO'd in 2020. It took 17 years, if you trust me on that number, right? So as a result, well, I should say, why are companies staying private for longer? We like that bullet point three points. One, it's a pain in the butt to being a public company. It's expensive. It's a massive administrative burden. The moment a management team starts thinking about the idea of their company going public, tripping your legal, compliance, HR department, right? Second, volatility. If you're the management team of a private company, why the hell would you want to be susceptible to the volatility of the public markets. And therefore, you may be influenced to make much shorter term decisions in running your business in an effort to beat quarterly earnings estimates or making sure you're not lowering guidance moving forward, as opposed to let's just make a decision for what's best for our business long term as we continue to build out our business and our product suite. And lastly, and most relevant and probably most important, access to capital. 20, 30 years ago, 
a lot of companies were almost forced in order to raise a certain amount of capital to finance future growth. Today, as the private market has grown, those same demographic of companies can tap into, say, working with other institutional investors. Adam mentioned pension plans, endowments, the venture capital world, Sequoia Capital, Kleiner Perkins, Andreessen, IDP Partners, or hey, the private shares fund can now cut a 30, 40, $50 million check. Essentially, again, providing that capital to maintain that certain growth profile. And so there's been this paradigm shift or is the private markets we feel now are predominant. So I have a question for the room. Of all US companies today that are doing over $100 million in annual revenue, what percentage do you feel are public versus private? Throw them out. 40% are public? 50-50. All right. About 75% of all U.S. companies doing over $100 million in revenue are private companies, which means that about 74% of those, of those companies, your average investor has not had the ability to invest in. You also look at the side on the right-hand side. So is anyone familiar with the term unicorn? Not obviously the fairy tale that we all know, but a unicorn, for those that aren't aware, is basically a term inside of the private markets, which is any company with an enterprise valuation over a billion dollars. And what this chart shows you is the exponential growth that we've seen in these unicorns over the last decade. 2010, there was one. There was one company in the US that was private that was valued over a billion dollars. Can anyone guess what that company was? Apple. Facebook. Today, yeah, there's over, I'll just tell you, there's over 1,200. So the landscape of investment into this ecosystem has grown exponentially. Getting rich. Sure. As an investor, what this means, you could buy a, a public company when, on its IPO at the earlier innings of its life cycle. And as a, a public market investor, participate in the growth and therefore return of the company as it went from a small to a smid to a mid into a large cap. Today, because companies are staying private for longer, most of them now are exiting almost into this mid, in some cases, large cap. And so 20 years ago, if you could have bought, and I'll go back to this chart, into an Apple after four years of being around, or Cisco Systems, and participated in that growth and in those returns. Today, the majority of that growth, and therefore returns, is taking place in the private market. And I think this is probably the most, one of the most compelling slides that I, I show folks like Steve. But it's a case study of the last 12 years. And simply what it looks at are your returns on average six and 12 months IPO? If you can walk around. I don't even think any, nobody can see you on there. Of a product, of a company's life cycle. So the first phase we look at they is the people did it. financing, right? So the way in which these companies grow is they have financing rounds. So as a startup company, you have your Series A. And as you grow bigger, you need to additional capital, you have your Series B. For SpaceX, you're on your Series P. But we just said, let's just look at your last round. I can't like sit for that. No, the exact same company at the IPO price. And then lastly, your average investor not only does not have the ability to buy the companies while they're private, they're also not getting in at the IPO price. You're getting in at first trade. The numbers speak for themselves. Frankly, they're not even close. So the goal of the private shares fund is to, again, provide all investors access to this growth and to that, those returns. And so if you look at our portfolio holdings, again, I'm sure you know, number, right. number two, accident space number three. You guys have kids that play Fortnite, Epic Games. Um, we're invested across 22 different sectors, aerospace, fintech, cybersecurity, agricultural technology. But historically, 
to invest in any of these companies that you see here or any private company in general, you needed to be a QP. And at, with the accreditation requirements come subscription documents, which I don't know if anyone's filled out, but they are laborious. They can be 50, 60, 70 plus. Sometimes you need to hire a lawyer to go through these things. They have high minimums, right? It could be 50,000, could be a quarter of a million. It could be a million dollars plus. They issue K-1s. They generally have lockup provisions anywhere between five to 10 years plus. There's layered fee structures. I mean, not only are you paying a 2% management fee, 3% management fee, but you could have a carry or a performance fee anywhere from 15 to 25%. So the goal of the private shares fund is to eliminate all of that. Our goal is to provide a turnkey solution to give any investor, regardless of accreditation, access to this part of the market. Because there's no accreditation requirements, there's no paperwork. You buy this just like any other open-ended mutual fund, meaning there's a ticker, right? So there's A shares, there's I shares. The minimum isn't $100,000. It's $2,500. We issue a 1099. You're not locked up for a decade. Similar to Adam's products, quarterly tender, quarterly liquidity. And we have no performance fee. We have no carry. So from an operational standpoint, much more efficient. Okay. So the, what I'll, I'll close with here. Yeah, of course. So we offer, we offer both. So if you were to buy this fund, you're buying the whole basket. What we're starting to do in this conversation we have with Steve, we've started to have, in some cases, opportunities uh, to invest in direct deals. Um, but the minimums on that, that's through a traditional LLP. Yeah, so direct deals are going to be much higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But okay. Uh, so like boring company is going to be. Yeah, so like right now, we have a direct investment opportunity in Axiom Space. They're building a new national space. That minimum is five million. Um, but that has nothing to do with the, the fund. Um, I'll just close out by saying very similar to, again, what Adam said. This fund has two parts. Everything that I talked about before, why private markets, how our fund provides easier access. But most importantly, from an investment standpoint, portfolio construction, the lack of correlation. Right. Um, this fund has held up very well in difficult market periods, whether if it's last year, um, you know, the fund finished up 70 basis points. Right. And when the S&P was down 19 percent. Um, so lack of correlation in addition to access to uh, private growth companies. And you can see, obviously, the performance over a one year period, a three year period, a five year period outperform in traditional small caps. So, um I appreciate everyone's time. And like I said, I'll be hanging around all night. So if anybody has any questions or wants to talk about companies, happy to do so. Okay. You're the PDF. So this is Steve from uh, Equitable. This is what I've been talking to me about the, uh, the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. We'll learn more about that and how it all works, why this makes sense. So. Uh, and then after that, then we'll have food and God. So it's tough duty. You just have to listen for another 20 minutes or so, and then then you'll get to the putting golf balls and eating food. So here's here's Steve. Don't worry, I'll only go for the next 45. So Steve doesn't have to tell his joke. I think you guys would appreciate that one. Um, so while I'm pulling this up, I don't have a cool fun to talk to you about with high performing uh crazy asset classes like space or um, private real estate. I'm going to talk about something really boring. Uh, how many of you ever heard of the S&P 500? So I, I don't know why Steve wanted me to close because I get the most boring thing to talk about. Uh, you know, the S&P 500, it, it's kind of boring if you think about it. It's 500 large cap companies and you don't really see record growth on average in most of these companies. Obviously, the fine stocks drove some of that for a little bit. But let me ask you a question. How many of you have a crystal ball that tells you exactly where the market is going? So you've got yours. I've got one question. Why are you here? Because uh, there's a bunch of islands that you could buy if you wanted. Um, you know, so I travel across the state and people always ask me, hey, Steve, what's the market going to do? And my answer is yes. 
Yes, it's going to go up. Yes, it's going to go down. Yes, it's going to be sideways. Yes, I have no idea what is going to happen to your money. But I can promise you this, that tomorrow the market will go up. Tomorrow the market will go down. And it, what happens to your money, I have no clue. So how many of you are really nervous about the market today? So we got some late folks walking and waving their hands. Why are you guys afraid? What's going on that could make you so afraid of the market right now? Biden's in charge. That's one reason. Somebody might say the other guy was in charge. You, you never really know. And if you turn on the news, do you ever see anything positive? So I always look at this. Um, you didn't know I was going to do this. So this is a better joke than yours. Um, you know, where do you get your news from? It's either positive, negative. So you know, I always ask, I'm going to offend everybody here. So some people get their news from CNN, as I like to call it, constantly negative news. Uh, some people like to get their information from FAUX news. Uh, other people might say, hey, you know, I, I really like ABC, always bullcrap. So yes, constant bullshit, right? So I think I offended everybody equally. But when you put it together, nobody really puts you on because your name is there. Nobody's excited. But nobody puts anything out there that's positive, right? When you really think about it, it's always negative and why? Well, well fear sells. And, you know, at the end of the day, what has the market done after COVID? We watched it fall almost 30 points in or 30% in a week. That if you bought it at the right time, you get an 80% rate of return. So how many of you love that roller coaster ride of volatility? It's like, I always take my nephew to Disney and his favorite ride is the Tower of Terror. Well, he loves the up and down. Way better than it's a small world, which is kind of boring, right? But you know, at the end of the day, let me ask you a question, Steve. What's the market doing right now? Is it up? Is it down? Is it sideways? What do you think? It's up for the year. But did your portfolios recover yet? Or everybody's portfolio recovery. Right? That's something I always ask. And a lot of people tell me, well, you know, I'm not there yet. But what if there were strategies out there that if the market went up, you made money? I think everybody would be okay with that strategy. What if the market was flat and you had the ability to make money? Would that work? That one, people raise a little bit of eyebrows. And this one, you're going to sit there and be like, all right, Steve, why is this guy here? What if the market was down and it gave you a positive rate of return? Yeah. You're going to make money when the market goes down. Um, what's that? It's not fishy, I promise. Um, so we're going to kind of dive into this a little bit. So Steve likes to call this the Reese's cup. And when you take chocolate and peanut butter and put it together. So you can't really see this here too well, but I'm going to talk towards it. Let's say I protected the first 10% of loss for you and the market went down 12%. How much did your portfolio go down? 2%, right? How many of you are upset if the market's down 12 and you're down two? Be honest. You're going to be upset because you lost money. Don't lie to me. But at the end of the day, if you lost less than everybody else, that's a lot better, right? So you can look to your neighbor and say, hey, I didn't go down as far as you did. What's that? It's predictable, right? So if you know you have the first 10% of loss covered, for a lot of people, they say that works. But what if the market went down 8% and I covered the first 10? You lost nothing. Does that work for most of you? I think most of you are going to say yes. Now, what if the market had a 0% rate of return? What would you make? Well, zero, right? That's in most investments. We've got a strategy that give you the ability to make 10% in a 0% market. Anybody have a problem with that? You make 10% in a flat market. Think that works? What if the market went up? I'll dive into that in a moment. So let's say the market went up 5%. Would you take the five or do you want the 10? Take the 10. We'll give you the 10. So there's strategies out there. People always ask how we do this. To keep it very simple, it's an options play. That we use. So we're betting on the market going up. We're betting on the market going down. Then we take somebody's bet on the market going up. And we take somebody's bet on the market going down. That's how we put it together. And I'll dive more into that in a second. But you know, let me ask this. You're all okay to get a little bit more return when the market is flat. That works for you. But let me ask you this. If the market went up 15 and you only got 10, would that be a problem? You guys can say yes. It's okay. Because we're, we're inherently greedy, right? We want all the upside, but you have to take some of the good with the bad. Now, here's the good news. How many of you ever heard this? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. So the money that goes in this only went up 10. The money that Steve would keep outside of this would have went up 15. Well, he'd make sure you made some more money. That's what he'd do for you. So yeah, this is a strategy that we use. And on paper, it works really well. But that only helps if the market's flat or up. What if I could help you make money in the down? This is a strategy that we call the dual direction. And what this one does is if the market is down 10% or less, whatever the negative is becomes a positive. So if the market is down 5%, you get a positive 5%. How many of you are okay with that? Yeah. Would work out pretty well. 
we can even go down to a 15% level of protection. So let's just say by the time you invested last year, the S&P was down 15. You would have actually made 15% when the market was down 15. Now, everybody always asks this, well, it's, hold on, it's called dual direction. So does that mean if the market goes up, I go down? No. So I always bring that part up. So if the market was up 10, you got the 10% rate of return. Just like the other one, if the market had gone up 15 and you had an upside of 10, you cannot go above the upside. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you like fees in your investments? Most people don't. There's no management expense to invest in this strategy the way we do this because it's got the limit on the upside and the protection on the downside. You're not going to have to pay any fees to be in this type of product. So that's something I always make sure people know. So there's no upfront cost that you pay. Um, one of the strategies that Steve uses, so it's just his fee that you normally pay him for managing your money. So it's a strategy that we use. But here's where that Reese's peanut butter cup part kind of comes together. You saw one strategy where as if the market was flat or up a little bit, I gave you the ability to make money. Then I had another strategy where as if the market was down, I had the ability to turn that negative into a positive. This is one that we put together to make that Reese's peanut butter cup where it takes the best of both. If the market is up, you're making money. If it's flat, you're making money. And if it's negative at all, you go up to that predetermined return level of the cap. So for example, let's say the upside was eight on the upside. If the market was down one, you're up eight. If it's down five, you're up eight. If it's zero return, guess what you're up? Eight. And if it's up two, you get the eight. If it goes up 10, how high do you go up? Just eight. So yeah, you know, Steve was talking about uh, you know correlations of the market. So I am a big fan of some of the oxymorons that are out there. So jumbo shrimp is usually one that I go with. And we're going to invest in the S&P and it's correlated to it, but it's also a non-correlating asset because at the end of the day, if the S&P goes down and I made you go up, that works. If it has a low return and I got you a higher return, I think you would say that works. And if it went up and I gave you the full upside, I think that works as well. But if it really goes down and you get the ability to lose less, does anybody have an issue with losing less than you should have? I don't think anybody does. So I always kind of explain it this way. Somebody says, all right, hey, you work for an investment company. Why would you do this for no cost? We've, we have the ability to charge you for it if we really wanted to. But it's baked in there where there's that cap on the upside where we can give you the ability for that growth without having to take a fee for you. So we do make our money off that. We're not a non-for-profit. We do make money. But at the end of the day, we don't have to pass any charges on you. So the, the example I try and use, you can figure out how to do this on your own in a brokerage account. I could walk you through how to do it but you can't get the pricing that we would get. So how many of you have a Sam's Club, BJ's, Costco membership in your wallet right now? I'd say almost everybody here has one. I ask you this one question. How come you didn't just pick up a phone and call the Bounty Paper Towel Corporation and say, hey, I want the same price you give Costco. I don't want to pay a Costco membership. You know, they'll do that for you, right? And then you'll have to buy 12 shipping containers full of paper towels to have them come. Or you sign up, you pay your $100 membership, you grab a hot dog while you're walking around and you fill your card up with a bunch of stuff you didn't need. Or you take the Amazon method that uh, he's, his family takes and I'm getting ready to go home and grab a couple packages myself. But at the end of the day, our strategy is this, we've got a uh, insurance contract that you're in, gives you some extra protection where there's you know, some of these bank crises with liquidity. Insurance companies don't have that same risk. So it adds some protection to a portfolio while giving you some insurance on your money. So that's where the, uh, Steve actually coined the phrase, the Reese's peanut butter cup. I always called it peanut butter and jelly, but I stole that one from him. And that's what I've got for you. So I really appreciate the time. And I think, Steve, you're going to come up and uh, close us out, right? Oh. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for joining us for the, the uh, content. Um, I think it's all interesting things we're talking about over here. Uh, the speakers will be around to answer any of your questions about anything in detail, or if you have any questions now, you know, we have like five minutes to ask questions. But you know, what I like about all the different speakers is it's, it's, it's something different. These are things that people really haven't, they don't come across all the time. You're getting access to institutional real estate you normally couldn't get access to that, you know, really doesn't really move with the market. You're getting access to companies like SpaceX and which I never knew you could even get access to companies like SpaceX. And then you're getting this, uh, to me, absolutely crazy thing where 
if the market goes down by 10%, you actually make 11 and a half percent. So, um, and, and there's actually different asset class you can invest in that. So there's a whole different menu of different things that they have with the, uh, that equitable thing where you can, we can design a program for you, you know, based upon what you want to invest in and what your risk tolerance is to come up with a, you know, a, a investment that, that makes sense for you. So if anybody has any questions? What was your joke? Oh, okay. So he asked for the joke. Some people have not heard it. How do you get out of here? Man, um, a guy walks into a bar, okay? Goes up to the bartender. He says, I'll bet you $100 that I can bite my eye. The bartender looks at him. Seems like it's a pretty safe bet. What does the guy do? He goes, he takes out his glass eye, and he bites it. The bartender feels really stupid. But uh, you know, he pays him his hundred dollars. Oh, really? Then goes back to him again. The guy and he says, "I'll bet you double or nothing that I can bite my other eye." Bartender off. looks at him. See no evidence of his seeing an eye dog. The guy can obviously see. What does the guy do? He goes out, takes out his false teeth, and he bites his other eye. So the bartender, again, man of his word, pays him his money. Feels really stupid. Um, but he pays his money. Then the guy goes into the corner, he goes and talks to some people and he comes back to him and he says, I'll bet you double or nothing that you could put a shot glass all the way down to the bar. This happens to be one of those really, really long 50 foot bars. And he says, I'll bet you could put a shot glass all the way in that bar and I will pee in that shot glass and I will not spill a drop on the bar. The bartender looks at this. The physics is utterly impossible. There's no way this guy can pull this off. What does the guy do? He goes and he pees all over the bar. He does not get a drop in the shot glass. The bartender's jumping up and down. He's all excited. He won his $200. And then he goes to me, he said, said, why did you make that bet? He said, I bet those people over there are $1,000. I can peel your bar, be happy about it. So, so aside from that being the only joke that I tell, and it's the only joke that I know, the reason I tell that joke is because of the segue. The segue is that guy knew the odds of things. He knew you have a better chance of success in certain having access to certain things. And what we learned about tonight is if you have access to certain things, it helps to increase your returns and reduce your risk. When you look at the Harvard and Yales of the world, they have like... 30% of their money in so-called alternative investments, private equity, IPO, using all kinds of different strategies with hedge funds and things like that. A lot of people don't have access to what the Harvard and the Yale's of the world have access to. Investing in things like you have tonight gives you access to things like that. So that's why, you know, aside from the golf and the food, that's why I thought it was important to have you here yeah. to listen about these things. They're a little bit off the beaten path, but I think are interesting things to learn. So without further ado, I think we're, we're ready to go. And I never, I never ended my seminar with my joke or my segue. <laughs> Thank you all for coming and uh, golf and food now. Oh, if anybody wants any of the materials, we have materials from uh, Paulo here. You guys can get things on that. And yeah. I think you have in yep. information on the pre-IPO fund and if you, uh, Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. I have some things on there too to share with people. Just leave it. We're here next time. I didn't know. Uh, so where where are we going now? She's just upstairs. You never told me that part. Did you? Please. Number twelve. They want to play the tour. Um, there's. TD, Fidelity. The last one. Yes. Easy. Um, then you see it like Cambridge, you can buy it. Lincoln, you can buy it. LPL, you can't buy it. Well, so let me I'll turn it on. So you could buy the rack, you're saying you're going to probably hit the. Got it. So we'll see you. Work with the cash share. I share. I share. It's. Oh, really? Yeah. So, I for Ah, yeah. Oh, 
So I walk in and her kids are like, I'm like, I put two and two together. And he's like, dude, I heard this way. I'm just feeling like, fuck, man. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we're just going to go over here. But... Yeah, from the guy for us. I was like, what's that mean? It's a screen. That's what it looks like. But yeah, because it's like those people are just really sitting there. This is I So, yeah, so this is the share is the same as five bucks. So, uh, in the first page, right? So, yeah, uh, that and then this, that's actually all this. So, this is all of our. Give us a price. So, I didn't raise the sheet. Here we go. Very normal to this. Okay. Yes, yeah, both are great products. Okay, got it. Got it. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, this is this again. I just put in the bed of brown shoes. He was very hard. But he did not do it with that. So, see, yeah, he wants it all. Sometimes the city is so peed out that I think so. I was I've been covering a lot of I can't believe it. I can't um, 
I gotta make sure that everybody should come to the next time. So, you should commit to it. I'm all the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Same here. Same um, here. The long day so far. Year, the market did really well, and I heard the cash going to be five. You want to get five. If you do, you stay. If you don't, see find another investor. So he structures it that way so you're not stuck with the insurance company because you probably heard this. Now that it's expensive, they kind of money up for a long time. You know, I'm going to tell you I was fine up for it. No, we've been in there for a while. So you keep it, but they can leave it at the time. So we don't, <laughs> we don't do the one that ties you. Well, what insurance company is? Equity. So it was formerly known as Accept, I believe that that's not reasonable. So, uh, so basically, are, are you guys betting on the market flow? Yeah. Uh, within a range, we have to bet. So there's a mathematical way to do options. If you want to just go crazy on the upside, we just bet like a crazy return on public hits. What we're actually doing is, mm -hmm. let's say, the cap. I'm trying to do it the simplest way. Okay, there's something with the, that we can sell for ten dollars that's going to pay up your fee. And, and then we'll take that after we're exchanging buys and doing for two dollars. I'm pay us seven, but we get it. And we'll have the spread that we work on in between. Okay. So there's a, a way to do it that we can always sell that. And that's the key. Rather than the money, we'll see how we make our 
profit something that we've gained some from out of their language you that is that we're going to go up like you don't want your trade you get further out again most people are okay you know so less the turn you're going to be like so often the, the simplest way that i can explain it to you so you've all put your car into the blue book to see what it is worth and let's say you have 25 right you go to the car dealership it's the beginning of the month you get 20 this month they don't need to be but you also have a long of the quarter and you can say that when you're 30, that means it's what somebody is willing to tell you to work. I'm not going to do that. Okay. So it's all called. I mean, I'm going to do the market. Go ahead. Yeah, the market down. Yeah. Because I think I can do it. And that's what creates a box. Yeah. You know, the difference between this and stuff you know, it's not only the SOP model, but the gross and access. This tells me you can have a fortune out of them. And long term, I'm going to do that from the offside. Which I there's a strategy we have to go long term that are untapped. We use the short term, use those kind of short term action, use other strategies outside of us to the long term. So, really, this is for that. Yes, you can use it for grow to our perfection, or like how you want to. The way she's kind of using it today is a protection method. You could use it as a growth strategy as well. I'm going to shut this down. Okay. That makes more sense than an eye.